By the time you're watching this video, Nigeria has already played their first match in the African Cup of Nations. With the largest population in all of Africa, several players across the best leagues in Europe and the fourth most AFCON titles, Nigeria is always seen as a top contender to win this prestigious competition. But there's one problem. The Super Eagles have an extremely unbalanced squad where their best players are all playing up front. Oziman, Boniface, Awani, Orban, Chukweze, the list goes on and on. But now the question stands, is it just a coincidence? Well, in this video, I'm going to explain you once and for all why does Nigeria have so many goddamn strikers and in the end, I'll give you my two cents on how they could still enjoy a successful run despite their uneven group of players. But before we start, if this isn't the first time watching Throne FC, please consider subscribing. I hate to be asking this in the beginning of the video, but I really need your help to get this channel to 10,000 subscribers. Now without further ado, let's get right to it. First of all, let's make something clear. Nigeria has always produced incredibly talented strikers. Yakini, Yakubu, Kanu and Martins in the last 30 years and even if you go back to the early stages of their development as a national team, their best player Teslim Balogun was also playing up front. Nowadays, that phenomenon only got more apparent, as despite barely making the top 50 in the FIFA national team rankings, only 9 nations have scored more goals than the Nigerian players across the top 5 leagues. They're by far the top scorers among all African countries and they even rank above some major footballing nations including Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark and Croatia. But how is that possible? How could Nigeria produce so much talent in one position and then have their best keeper playing in Cyprus and only 5 midfielders in their 25 man list for the AFCON? Spoiler alert, it's not a coincidence. It's kind of a taboo topic to mention genetics in football but they have certainly played a role in this scenario. Nigerian players tend to be tall, strong and explosive which are key attributes not only for the striker position but also for defensive midfielders and center backs. Which interestingly are the two roles where Nigeria has also produced a significant amount of talent. Many countries have tendencies to generate a certain type of footballer in greater amounts. I mean Senegal as a contrast tends to produce more defensive players. But this new wave of strikers can't be solely attributed to genetics. Nigeria's cultural and societal background also plays a big part into the development of their future stars. You see, despite their great size and wealth compared to the other African nations, Nigeria is still very much behind the current acceptable standards in what comes to scouting, youth coaching and sporting infrastructures. That combination of factors leads to a lesser development when it comes to attributes like positioning, passing quality and to their overall reading of the game. And even if some players actually stand out in the aforementioned attributes, the average scouts will fail to recognize their talents as their attention is usually on more noticeable qualities like finishing and above average physicality. On the other hand, the Nigerian youngsters are not naive. They know what the scouts usually pay attention to and they know that their best shot of making it big as a footballer is to get a chance to play in Europe. So they model their playing style around scoring goals and impose themselves over their opponents. Then those strikers who get opportunities to play in bigger clubs explode when they're coached by someone who actually knows how to take full advantage of them, while the technical players get left behind and eventually stagnate. There's absolutely no denying that there's still some racial bias in football into what the player is capable of based on where they come from, but in my eyes that simply stems from the lack of proper coaching during their youth years. It's quite easy to understand. If you aren't taught differently you're just gonna play the way it feels more natural to you. Couple that with the desire to get noticed and you get a golden generation of strikers. So now what? How can Giuseppe Pizzero win the African Cup of Nations with such an unbalanced team? Well, for starters, fire Giuseppe Pizzero. Just kidding. But in all seriousness, I have zero trust in him as a coach and as a leader. As a Portuguese football fan, I've lost count the amount of teams that only got worse after his arrival. But let's pretend that maybe this time he's able to keep a locker room on his side. Because that's one of the most important managerial qualities in this situation. There's no way he can start Sadi, Koziman, Yenashu and Mofi at the same time and the situation would be even harder to manage if Modifast didn't suffer an injury. So it's important that he's able to keep the players egos in check and make sure everyone is working towards the team's goal and not to stand out. From a tactical point of view, he has to ditch the 4-3-3. Playing with two strikers up front became outdated but in this case it's simply the right thing to do. In their upcoming matches against Equatorial Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, Pazer should try to play in a 4-2-4 formation with Uzo in goal, Colvin Basie and Shidozi as centre-backs, Olaine as right-back and Zaidu on the left. 
In central midfield, Iwobi and Onyedika should work well as a duo, with Iwobi having more freedom to create chances and Onyedika working a more defensive role, possibly trying to stop the eventual counter-attacking efforts. On the wings, I would start Moses Simon and Lukman as both men guarantee goals and assists, while Chukweze could be used during the second half to rip the defenders apart in one-on-one -on -one situations later in the game. Up front, you have to start Doziman and Mofi. They're simply the most informed strikers in the group, and both men could make up for their respective weaknesses, with Mofi having more creative freedom and Oziman winning the majority of the aerial duels. When playing against tougher opponents, Puzer could then try a 4-3-3 formation, giving up Mofi for more solidity in midfield and start Frank Onyeka. But then again, if the Super Eagles found themselves in disadvantage, they should obviously ditch this formation to play more offensively. Ultimately, I don't have great hopes for an iconic Nigerian win in this year's African Cup of Nations. They have two notable absences due to injury and an incompetent coach who has never achieved anything remarkable in his entire career. However, I see an incredible amount of potential in this squad. Nigerian is a coach who's willing to put his own philosophies aside and work with what he's been given, creating a stable core of players and managing their frustrations when things don't work the way they do at club level. If that happens, I can definitely see Nigeria becoming a pleasant surprise in the upcoming World Cup. And that is it for the video. Don't forget to leave a like so I know you want to watch more content like this and subscribe to never miss the most interesting football discussions, stories and top 10 lists. Thank you for watching till the end, I appreciate you and I will see you soon.